Good afternoon. I'm Mandy Cohen. I'm the Secretary of Health and Human Services for North Carolina. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm joined by Director Sprayberry and as well as Brian Tipton and Nicole Fox doing our American Sign Language interpreters and working behind the scenes are our Spanish interpreters, the sisters Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. So I'm going to start with a rundown of the numbers and I'll turn it over to Director Sprayberry. Uh, as of this morning, 89 counties in North Carolina have COVID-19 cases. We have 2,870 cases now in North Carolina. That's up about uh, sorry, 800 since just Friday. Of these cases, 8% of them are ages 18 to 24. 48% are ages 25 to 49, 28% are 50 to 64, and 21% are over the age of 65. We currently have 270 people hospitalized. This is up another 11 since Friday. And sadly, we've had 33 deaths. That's another 14 people since Friday that we've lost. Obviously, our hearts are with those families at this time. We've done more than 40,000 tests that have now been completed across labs from uh, the state lab to private labs to our academic partners. They have reported those as negative tests, though not all do report. In addition to these numbers, this morning, a collaborative of North Carolina data experts from the private and public sectors released a North Carolina-specific modeling forecast, looking at how COVID-19 could affect our state in the coming months. The model reinforced the things we're already doing, the need for social distancing to slow the spread of COVID-19 and ensure that hospital care is there for the people who need it. The team found that the social distancing policies we currently have in place in North Carolina will help lower the likelihood that we'll overload our health care system. That's good news. On the flip side, they found that if we ended those social distancing efforts at the end of April, it could lead to a greater than 50% probability that we will outstrip our acute care and ICU bed capability possibly as soon as Memorial Day. They also found that if social distancing was to stop at the end of April, roughly 750,000 North Carolinians could be infected by June 1st, as opposed to around 250,000 uh, if some form of effective social distancing remains in place. Social distancing flattens the curve so that fewer people get sick at the same time. We know when people aren't coming into contact with each other, it lowers the chance that they will, be, they will either catch or pass on the virus. So that was a lot of news this morning, and I'm sure we'll answer your questions about that. We also heard over the weekend about face coverings and what, that, what role they play in slowing the spread of the virus. First, I want to note that face coverings are not the same thing as the face masks that are needed by our healthcare providers and first responders. The Centers for Disease Control updated its guidance over the weekend and recommends wearing a cloth face covering in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain, such as groceries in grocery stores or in pharmacies. They are not recommending medical face masks. Our supplies of face masks need to go first to those on the front lines. Our healthcare workers need protection. But for the rest of us, cloth coverings can play a role in controlling the spread if they are used properly and in combination with other tried and true things like washing your hands, wiping down surfaces. If used incorrectly, face coverings can expose someone to more germs rather than less. The very best evidence on reducing the spread of the virus is to social distance and stay home. So please help us to continue to, to save lives by staying home. I'm going to turn it over to Director Spayberry, and then we'll take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Good afternoon. Today is day 28 of the State Emergency Operations Center activation for the COVID-19 response. 64 counties have activated their local emergency operations centers. 
99 counties in the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians have declared states of emergency. National Guard planners will begin to deploy later this week to help with advanced planning at 10 county emergency operation centers with our local partners. We're continuing to plan and prepare for medical surge to have enough facilities and beds available for when the hospitals are filled. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and engineers from the National Guard have conducted many facility assessments across the state to find locations that are suitable for patient housing and for alternative hospital space. Our mission to find and obtain supplies continues. On Friday, we received a shipment of more than 600,000 surgical masks from a private vendor. That's in addition to the 598,000 surgical masks we've gotten from the national stockpile. Of all the hard to get personal protective items we're seeking, surgical masks are one item where we have had some success. But we still need more of all types of personal protective equipment. Once again, I want to remind everybody that 911 is for emergency calls only. Please refrain from calling to report stay at home or social distancing violations. We need to keep 911 lines open for true emergencies. <clears throat> Enforcement of stay at home is up to local law enforcement and is being handled differently depending on where you live. Check your local government website. Some counties have stay at home hotlines where you can call with questions or send an email with a question. If everyone does their best to stay at home and observe social distance, these calls will not be necessary. 211 is taking thousands of calls daily from people who need information or help with resources like food, utilities, child care, and other needs. If you call and get a fast busy signal, it means that all incoming lines are tied up with other callers. Wait an hour or so and try your call again. For twice daily information updates on coronavirus, you don't have to call. Just text COVIDNC to 898-211. That's 898-211. You can get text in either English or Spanish. In order to save lives and keep people healthy, we need everyone to stay at home and stay distanced to stop the spread. Think about your loved ones who are elderly or in poor health. They are the ones you are putting at risk by ignoring the guidance and not staying home. Thank you for your support of the state emergency response team. Don't forget to call your loved ones daily. With your help, we will get through this together as one team, one mission, one family. Thank you, and I'm turning it back over to Dr. Cohen at this time. Thank you so much, Director Sprayberry, and now we'll open for your questions. Uh, during Friday's press briefing, Governor Cooper mentioned that your team will be looking at some information over the weekend about how much movement's going on statewide. My question is, what type of tools is the state using in terms of aggregate cell phone data to track public movement? And also, are there any privacy concerns that arise from that use? Matt, thank you for the question. So there are a number of data sources that we're looking at in terms of understanding our folks complying with, with the stay-at-home order. I think you know at the end of last week, Google put out some uh, new data that was very detailed across the entire world, across this country, across the state. Uh, unfortunately, that data ended prior to the stay-at-home order here in North Carolina and going into effect, but it did show that folks were starting to uh, uh, comply with the orders that had put, been put in place before stay-at-home, the closing of, of schools, the, the canceling of mass gatherings, closing of restaurants and bars in, in, uh, in restaurant dining. So some of that already had, a, had an impact, so that was good to see. We're also seeing that there are a number of other uh, studies that have shown some tracking of cell phone data that helped uh, and gave folks a grade uh, by, by county, how well folks are moving around. I think all of those things are, are data that we look at to see how well are we doing at complying with social distance. 
I think study after study, no matter what model you look at, whatever study you look at, continues to tell us that social distancing slows the spread of the virus. And we know that is so critical as we move forward here. And acting early is so critical, right? We want to do this early. So by the time by the time the virus would be here, it'd be too late. We need to do this before we see the virus overwhelming our medical system, right? We want to be slowing the spread of the virus so that our health care resources Sources are there for everyone who needs it. Um, and so we're going to continue with the efforts that we've been doing. We'll continue to look at a, a lot of different data inputs to understand our folks complying with the social distancing efforts we've done so far. Do we think we need to go further in that? We will continue to evaluate that on a day to day basis. Thanks for the question. Next question, Allison Smith, Fox 8. Hey, Dr. Cohen, um, basically we know a lot of people in the communities are taking advantage of the local restaurants doing takeout. So my question is, what is the best protocol for these establishments employees? Do they need to be wearing gloves all the time? Do they need to have one person handling that money, those payments and transactions, and another handing out the food? What is the best, uh, best protocol for them to be following? Thanks, Allison, for that question. And I'm appreciative that so many of our restaurants and um, and others are really taking serious this order to say we need to be careful. We need to be doing as much as we possibly can to social distance and minimize. I don't think there's one perfect protocol here. What I would say is for everyone to use their best judgment. I think minimizing the number of people who are involved in the transaction. So uh, again, limiting the amount of contact, keeping folks as far away from each other as possible, so six feet apart. I know many restaurants are, are not having anyone walk into their establishment, are bringing things right out to the car, are using gloves. I think gloves are important, but again, it doesn't get you away from needing to wash your hands. So important, washing your hands, washing down surfaces. I would say this from the restaurant side as well as the consumer side. You want to be making sure you're wiping down uh, your, your surfaces and washing your hands as well. So there's no perfect uh, way to, to do this, but I think using good judgment to stay as far apart as possible, to be washing uh, hands and washing surfaces, um, and minimizing the number of people in, in the transaction. I know as many people as possible are trying to take, for example, credit cards over the phone to even minimize any additional transaction in the moment. I think all of those additional steps help, but there's no perfect way to do it. And we just appreciate everyone using as much good judgment as they can as we as we work through this. If we see additional data about a best practice, we will we will show it. I don't think we have that at this point. Lake Wood W A S W Yes, Dr. Cohen, this is Lake Wood with WA News. My question for you is we're hearing a lot about the possibility of a complete shutdown of North Carolina. How would something like that work? Thanks for the question and talking about a complete shutdown. I think we know that um, in doing this, our, our efforts are trying to slow the spread of the virus, but on an, any circumstance, Folks are still going to need to get groceries at the grocery store, pick up medicines, leave their home if they need uh, um, medical care. So there's always going to be things that folks need to do. And that's what the stay-at-home order says right now. Please stay at home as much as entirely possible unless you're doing those things, going out to um, grocery store, get your medicines. If you're one of the essential workers, we're also going to have those F folks that work at our medical facilities or our essential businesses. They will always need to go, go to those jobs. We want to make sure everyone is doing as much social distancing, even in those settings, as possible. Um, I do think we want to be maximizing everything we possibly can to do the social distancing now. I think what the data keeps showing us over and over is acting now, acting early, helps us get ahead and it buys us time to do the important work that director sprayberry and his team is doing in terms of getting us the resources we need for protective equipment making sure our hospitals have time to plan to surge their capacities so it's really important that we act now um, and we act with in, with everyone across the state really complying with stay at home so i i think there is more we can do I think there is um, more that I would like to see in terms of folks staying at home. I'd even like to mention, I know there's some important holidays coming up, a number of them, whether it's 
Good Friday and Easter, it's Passover and others. It's a time where families want to come together, where friends want to come together with deep traditions of doing that year after year. And unfortunately, this is just not that year. Um, try to think of creative ways to connect with your family, with your friends, with your, um, with your community, but by phone, by video. Um, and so I know that is hard, but I'm really appreciative of everyone um, really taking to heart the stay at home to slow the spread. I think this will be a hard week to do that with so many celebrations uh, um, and traditions, but uh, it's even more important that we heed that order to, to, to stay home at this point. So thank you. Tammy Grubb, The Herald Sun. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I had a question about the state's website on um, inpatient hospital bed count. When you look at the site, it says 64% of hospitals are reporting statewide. I understand this is for supply of beds and ventilators, but uh, does that have some indication toward uh, how prepared hospitals really are to to handle the surging in yes. cases, and also um, wondering if uh, why there's only 64 percent reporting. Thanks for that question about hospital reporting. So I, th I think this is a new effort for all of us in terms of reporting into the state in, in a frequency that we've asked them to do every single day um, to report that. And so I think we've been getting better over time. I think certain days we've seen as much as 90% reporting. So we, you know that, that's, that's been fluctuating a bit and we're trying to mature our process so we can really get a good understanding of what what capacity our hospital systems have. I do want to thank them for the work that they have been doing um, to, one, cut down on elective procedures to make sure there is capacity in our system and to save on protective equipment um, as we go forward, um, and then putting together very detailed plans of understanding if we do uh, start to see a strain in our resources, how could they even go beyond their current capacities to make sure that we can serve the people of North Carolina. So we continue to improve that reporting uh, day over day. What I would say is, well, we, we, the, the percentage of hospitals that are reporting in it's all of the big systems are doing that uh, routinely. I think it's a, a number of our smaller uh, hospitals that we continue to work with as they um, as, as they work on on, on this in a in, in a daily way. So continue to check back at our site. What I think it tells you right now today is that we are we do not have a strain on our medical uh, system. Uh, as I mentioned, about 250 folks uh, in the hospital right now with COVID-19. Uh, and that that is not putting a strain yet on our medical resources, but we know we need to be prepared in case that number changes. It could change very quickly. Um, so we continue to work with our hospitals to make sure that they are building up their capacity. Jody McCreary, CBS 17. Okay, we'll go to Gary Robertson, Associated Press. Hi, this is for either one of uh, you. Um, it seems like that we, um, while other states have had problems getting um, uh, supplies from the national stockpile, I mean, we've had our own, but we've had some successes in some areas. Have you been given any uh, um, reasoning why we seem to be doing okay in some measures? Is it just a matter of whether certain supplies are in greater supply than others, or are we doing something different that has allowed us to get uh, more um, needed supplies from the federal stockpile? Thanks for that question, Gary. I'm going to turn over to Director Sprayberry. Thanks, Gary. <clears throat> what we did is we did resource requests to the federal government uh, early on, and we began to receive um, shipments from the Strategic National Stockpile. We received three allocations. We didn't receive everything that we asked for. We did receive um, the first uh, al couple of allocations were pretty small. The third one was uh, somewhat larger. I wouldn't characterize it as all successful, <clears throat> but we did, uh, I think, get, like I said, a, a pretty good amount. Um, what we did is, because of the prioritization process that we have, 
uh, we had to send most of, of that, um, those supplies and equipment to our health care coalitions. Uh, currently, we're working very hard uh, to call vendors and manufacturers so that we can stock up on supplies and equipment. And I have to say that we've been pretty relentless about this, and we think that we're starting to see the supply line open up a bit so that we're going to be seeing more and more uh, of these supplies and equipment come into our warehouses so that we'll be able to uh, make more distribution and make a, a wider distribution. But I, I must say, Gary, it's, it's, uh, I think the problem that we're seeing has been not just in our state, but also locally as well as nationally and internationally. Um, we're hoping that in the days to come that uh, we'll be able to see the loosening of the supply chain, uh, but we are still, that's a top priority for us, and we're still working very hard at it. Thank you. Next question, Hannah Snoot, the Charlotte Observer. Hi there. Um, early, earlier this week, uh, the News and Observer reported that eight nursing homes and four residential care facilities in North Carolina have seen COVID-19 outbreaks. Um, is that still the correct number? And, and are, are you aware how many of those nursing homes and uh, care facilities are in Mecklenburg County? Hannah, thank you for the question. So that, that information is posted on our website when we hear of, a, of an outbreak. And again, an outbreak is just two or more cases in a long-term care facility. We are tracking those and reporting them. And that means that that outbreak lasts for at, at least 28 days. So we stay up there until we hear that things are, are uh, have been resolved or 28 days have passed. Um, so I don't have the exact number of nursing home um, folks and, and how many are in Mecklenburg, but you can look on our data dashboard uh, site again at ncdhhs.gov slash coronavirus, and that information is now being tracked there. Next question, Alex Shabad, WCNC. Hi, Dr. Cohen. I uh, wanted to know about, um, I know you're pushing urgently for action right now before it's too late. South Carolina is one of just nine states that haven't done the state stay-at-home order yet. And I'm just wondering what you think the impact that of that is on North Carolina and what your message would be to leaders in South Carolina. So we, look, we've been looking at data uh, across the board and all of the data points in the same direction, which is early action to reduce the spread of the virus is important so that we don't overwhelm our healthcare uh, system. I think every state has to look at their own data and make uh, decisions based on what they're seeing in their state. I have not looked at the uh, South Carolina numbers. Obviously, I'd be encouraging all uh, leadership to look carefully at their numbers, tailor it to what's going on in, um, in their state, and make sure to act early to slow the spread of the virus. Um, as I said, we continue to do that here in North Carolina, look at our numbers, look at how well we feel we are doing with uh, slowing the spread of the virus, understanding our medical surge capacity here in the state to make sure that we're able to have a health care system that can respond um, and to be able to be available to, to folks. So we'll continue to tailor our, our work as, as a state. Um, and I know we continue to get um, recommendations and guidance from the federal government as well um, on, on how to continue uh, that forward. But we'll always have to tailor things to here uh, in North Carolina, as I imagine South Carolina is doing as well. This is our last question, Richard Craver, Winston-Salem Journal. Yes, uh, Secretary Cohen, you were at the uh, presentation with the researchers early this afternoon, and you heard their opinion about the issue about the random testing of a uh, thousand individuals or whatever it might end up being. But I, I don't know if the Cooper administration or yourself have issued y'all's opinion on the random testing. So do you have one at this point? Yeah, so I think there's a number of of mechanisms that we want to deploy in order to best understand the virus here in North Carolina. So um, our state epidemiologists and their very large team of, of scientists and PhDs have put together a plan on how can we really get our arms around what is happening here in North Carolina. We know test results alone are not going to give us that 
full picture. Um, I think the data scientists talked about something called an iceberg effect, where we know we are testing some, but there is going to be some folks who we don't capture through that testing. And so we need to do other mechanisms, surveillance mechanisms, that allow us to understand that, that broader view of what is going on with the virus here in North Carolina. There's a number of techniques that we'll be deploying. We'll, we will be using our underlying flu surveillance system and modifying it for COVID-19. Some of that will be uh, uh, testing asymptomatic folks. So I think gets at the random sampling question I think that you are asking, right? It's us trying to understand um, the extent of the virus, both people who have symptoms and don't have symptoms. So we know um, where the virus is in the state. And again, it helps us tailor as we go forward to know what, what we need to do going forward. I think we're gonna take in a number of inputs. Um, modeling is one, the surveillance data another, and other inputs as we, we go forward here to best understand the virus in North Carolina, make the best decisions we can, knowing that we, we need to act early, need to make sure we're slowing the spread of the virus, as well as working on surging our medical capacity. So know that we're working on all fronts to really understand the virus. It's gonna take a partnership between the state and our academic partners. We wanna make sure we're prioritizing that work. Obviously, protective equipment, testing supplies, all of those things have been in limited supply. So we do have to do a serious prioritization within the state to make sure we're getting the really important, actionable information um, and make sure we're doing it in a way that allows us to really understand the virus. I, I let my scientists lead on that to tell us how to best prioritize to work with our academic partners um, on that. But do know we're working hard to understand the virus, tailor our interventions here, slow the spread, and make sure our medical system is there for folks. So um, I'll just leave uh, with, with this afternoon of saying thank you to, to folks who are staying home. Um, thank you for the good questions this afternoon, and we'll be back with you tomorrow to answer more. Thanks so much.